can get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with laughter on a bright morning in a battle over a chicken, and got better as it went along. It could have lasted a lifetime, but it didn't. It stopped on a gray morning with a little wishbone broken. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Little Wishbone. Sometimes the sun doesn't shine at 9 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes everything's just gray. The sky, the buildings, the streets, the faces going by, gray in a man's mind. And when I parked in front of the politely landscaped Suckle Square on Sunset Boulevard and got out of my car, I knew that this was just such a morning. And that was right as it should be, because what I had to tell her, what had to be said belonged in gray to the chilling half-light that leaves everything and everybody something less than real. To the half-light that maybe a moment before birth, maybe a moment after death. Yes, sir? I'd like to see Miss Jones. Miss Cordelia Jones, please. I called. My name is Philip Marlowe. Oh, oh yes, Mr. Marlowe. I'm Mr. Early. Come in, please. I, um... Uh, the police told me what happened, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. May I see you now, please? Hmm? Yes, of course. It's the last door down on the right-hand side. Uh, this way, Mr. Marlowe. The plush carpet that ran the length of the corridor was also gray. And that fit, too, with the morning and with what I had to tell Miss Cordelia Jones. But, well, it didn't fit with another morning. Three weeks ago. A morning that was bright inside and out. And it didn't fit with Jonesy. <laughs> oh, not Jonesy. The stranger in the butcher shop, the customer with the enchanting green-gray eyes. The girl who wanted the same sewing chicken I did. And in no uncertain terms. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, no, you don't. Possession, my friend. It's nine cents for the law. And that young lady is just what I'm holding. Namely, one wing, one neck, both legs. Give me that. No, I got here first. Oh, no, you didn't, Mr. Marlowe. There. Ah, but neither did you, Miss Jones. Ah, it was a tie. A photograph finish. Now, who really needs this scrawny little girl the most? Me. Me, yeah, no, I do. I am the one who needs... not all talking together. Now, you first, Miss Jones. I, I, I'll i be the judge. No, Fair please. enough, Mr. Schwartz. Your Honor, early this morning I was inspired. Yeah. I woke up thinking about chicken cacciatore. Chicken cacciatore? What do you think I was thinking oh, about? Please, I was please, thinking please, about... Please, about please, no, no interruptions now. Now, young lady, you woke up thinking about chicken cacciatore. Huh? Go ahead, my chief. Well, I think. For chicken cacciatore, you need chicken. And since I cook for one, I need a small chicken. End of testimony. Aha. Uh-huh. And you, Mr. Marlowe? The same, Judge. Honest to goodness. For inspiration, do I also cook for one? No, oh, ma'am. Is not even spoken for. <laughs> you? Uh-uh. Well, good. Then that does it. That does it. Solves the problem. Tonight, you have dinner together. Oh, no, we couldn't. We don't even know each other. Why, this is to... What's your name again? Marlowe, Phil Marlowe. What's yours? Jones, who do you Ah, but don't dare use the first part I answered as Jones. Oh, dear. Dear, now you know each other. Well, it's me, Jonesy. Oh, no, I... It's the 100 North Carolina. 8 o'clock. Don't be late, and Send the bird out, please, Mrs. Ford. Yeah, yeah. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hey. Uh, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, yes, Mr. Schwartz. Uh, you can put the chicken down now. We are the only ones in the shop. <laughs> And it had gone along at about the same set from the chicken cacciatore, which was the best I'd ever eaten. But only because I could look at the lovely chef while I ate it. Passed a wonderfully gabby evening that I didn't want to see end. But end it did. To lunch the next day and the day after. Oh, yeah, Jonesy was something all right. By profession, an artist around the edges. She painted beer cans and the like for an ad agency downtown. So her place on Sheremoya was half studio, half apartment, and all cozy. You know the kind of cozy that makes you want to curl up the second you walk in? <laughs> oh, we 
it makes you hate to leave. But leave you did because Jonesy liked to go places. Jonesy liked to do things. Liked to play miniature golf and badminton and, uh, of course, bowling every Wednesday night. Okay. Tomorrow on the front it is, but the lady still has one car left. All right, let's see it. Am I great or no? Which? Great, baby. Real great. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before we start through the observatory proper, and tonight's exciting trip to the moon. Oh, the ball that dirty, double-crossing deal. <laughs> Oh, I'm talking about you. You, you, you call my office. Pool beer tonight, you say. Let's just look at the moon. <laughs> yeah. Are you silly? You bet I expected Mulholland Drive. Yeah, park car and all. Oh, come on, Jonesy. We can still get out of here. You. Uh, have you two quite finished your little chat? Uh, quite. I, uh, here's a... <laughs> We're sorry. We'll be very quiet, we promise. Thanks, Paul. You will be close. Come on, Sue. You better stay with the others. Okay, we'll stay with you. <laughs> Something breaking you up, Junior? Yeah. Young love, my friend. Always does. Now, excuse me, but I don't think I care to listen to a charming guide anymore. Good night. Yeah, well, you're going to join the rest of us, Bill. Mm-hmm. That man going to the door. Yeah. What did he think? That he was leaving, that young love always broke him up. Why? Because I... I don't know. I guess I thought he was somebody else. Well, come on. This guy's great. He wouldn't miss him for a while. Or the moon over Mulholland Drive. Phil, be tactful, boy. Lady appreciates it. Most of the time. Hmm. Come on. <laughs> most inimitable style, Jonesy was crazy. But there, too, I went right along with her. Because in those three weeks, I passed up a half a dozen jobs for every one I took. Never stuck my chin out very far when I did go to work, and all in all, tried my best not to behave like the high school sophomore who suddenly realized that spring can mean something more important than baseball. We were at her place one night. The evening plans had called for me to sit as a model, from the wrist down exclusively. All I had to do was hold a bottle of Johnny Walker in the pouring position while she sketched it. But I just couldn't get with things. Still fidgeting again. Yeah, and I'm not going to get any steadier. How much longer, Jonesy? A minute. Don't think about it. What about tomorrow? Sunday. What are we playing? Loads of them. Give. Yeah. What happens first? I come over here. With breakfast, no doubt. Mm-hmm. And after hot cakes, bacon and eggs, coffee and lots of cigarettes, you we can... Uh... anything. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, come to think of it, I have. <laughs> Grapefruit broiled. <laughs> we'll start with that. Then the eggs basted, oh, and then... Oh, impossible. <laughs> I'm helpless. What next? After you've gorged yourself, I mean. Yeah, well, after I've gorged, we'll get into my car and take a ride. Say, uh, Laguna Beach? Oh, no, not that, Phil. Not Laguna. Uh-huh. You what? What is it, Jonesy? What's wrong with Laguna? Nothing, Phil. I... Oh, it's just that I don't like it there. It's an artist colony, you know. Go ahead. And it's where I couldn't make a go of it once. <laughs> I'd rather not go back. I'd rather go someplace else. Anytime. All right? Sure. Yeah, I thought it was something more serious, Jonesy. I mean, not that your work doesn't count, but... You're but... a detective without office hours, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Do I go back to the bottle bar? Uh-uh. You don't move an inch down. That's it. Yeah. Hey, give me that stuff. Pencils, board, paper, all of it. We'll put it over here, and I... Oh, you can't. <clears throat> I'm crazy. Oh, I'm sorry. You nervous, huh? Yeah. Oh, no damage done. I don't think. Glad it wasn't your watch. That's broken. Mm-hmm. Hey, baby, it's kind of cute. Miniature ice skates, huh? For my kid brother. Oh. I think we were going to be a great skating team when we grew up. Really? And uh, the four-leaf clothing? Oh, well, wisher. Way back at college. A girl. Mm-hmm. Hey, hey, kid. Tear our hearts entwined. How about that? Also, back at college, and none of your business. 
Okay. And this place? Hmm? Here, where the piece is broken off near the chain. What was that? Well... It was a, a wishbone. Hmm. The gold one, I lost it. You'll put the bracelet on my wrist, please. I, I just remembered I got to finish this sketch. It's due first thing Monday morning. Do you mind? You mean I got to pose tomorrow? No. No, thanks, Phil. I, I can finish it alone. I'll... I'll look for you tomorrow morning at 10. All right? All right. Good night, Jonesy. All the way home, I floundered someplace between pouting poor Marlowe. The girl he goes for keeps secrets from him. And plain male pride. Goodbye, Jonesy. You live your life and I'll live mine. But by the next morning, I told myself on the switch. Some things just weren't my business. I wasn't a private detective where Jonesy was concerned. It would all work itself out. Life would go on. And it did. Breakfast was wonderful. Broiled grapefruit and food. And the rides to what turned out to be Santa Barbara, perfect. So in the days that followed, no more was said about it. and Nothing unusual happened. Until the following Friday night, that was the night before last, we were at a square dance at a local Daughters of Something or Other Lodge. The exercise would do me good, she said, and I was learning in a hurry. I thought. <laughs> no! 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 Last to guide in her throat when we swung into a grand right and left, which abruptly brought her up against a tall, fat man with a circle of sweating face that offered cold, black buttons for eyes. Almost no nose and thin, pale lips that were twisted as far away from a smile as possible. Without saying a word to me, she ran from the floor towards the check room. And I started after her until suddenly I remembered the face that had just frightened her. The man who had laughed at young love that night at the observatory. The man Jonesy had thought she'd known. I turned back just in time to see him walk off the other side of the dance floor. Calmly leave the building by a side entrance, which was all the cue I needed. Hey! Hey, you! Hold it! I want to talk to you! You want to talk to me? Yeah, who are you, friend? And let's not bother with the routine we played at the observatory. Oh, yes, I remember you now. Good. What else do you remember? Come on, the girl in there. I want answers, mister. They mean a lot to me. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so I see. So you saw before, and I'll start talking. All right. That's just what I plan to do. You can tell her that for me. And also remind her that I was on the corner of Third and Oak, too, on Armistice Day. Third and Oak. On Laguna Beach. L- Laguna Beach? Yes. And if you don't mind, give her this, will you? Gold wishbone. A charm. Uh-huh. A charm that can't miss for me because both ends are in my hands, see? So when I pull it apart, as I make my wish, I can't move. There. Now the pieces, Mr. Big Talk. I turn them to the lady and tell her that I'll be heard from again. Good night. Good night. Yeah. You'll hear from me again, too. Your height, dark hair, pretty green eyes, a green dress. Oh, yeah, like... wait a minute. Uh, are you Mr. Marlowe, Nick? That's right. Did she leave a message? Yeah, she said to tell you she was going, but not home, just going. Just going? Yeah. Just going. For good. Oh, uh, want your hat and coat now, mister? Yeah. My hat and coat. No other word than that. And she wasn't coming back. I spent what was left of the night looking for her, checking from one place to another, but it was no good. And the next morning early, when I tried once more at a studio apartment, 
all I found out was that she never returned. I decided there was one place left to look. A street corner in Laguna where over a month ago something had happened that wouldn't lie still. I got in my car and headed south, and all the way down for once the Pacific surf looked cold and hostile. And the dreary desolation that hits all beach resorts out of season it settled on Laguna like a sick hangover. I finally found the intersection of Third and Oak. With two sleepy drugstores, a dying bar, and a pottery stand closed for the winter. Nothing else. The only sign of life was a black sweated old man on a bench, whittling listlessly at a piece of gnarled gray driftwood that matched his hands to perfection. It looked as though he'd been there for 20 years. So I decided to give him a try. What that you say, you know, fellow? I said things are pretty dull around here, huh, Pop? <laughs> I don't know. Generally, somewhere or something happening. People come, people go. Like you. They all got things on their mind. Uh-huh. They ought to come and go more often, Pop. You picked a dead corner, huh? Dead? Well, I don't know about that now. Seems like this corner gets a good share of life. Oh? I'll bet you nothing's happened in this corner in the last six months worth talking about. You're wrong, son. It's run the gamut. For instance, last August, a baby was born over in front of the drugstore there in a taxi. Mrs. Wright, Gail Wright it was. Uh. Old Cy Lemley, the druggist, delivered a fine job to an eight-pound boy. And, uh, on the other end of life? Yeah, that too. A fellow named Peters. He was a kind of belated war casualty, you might say. How do you mean? Well, he went through the First World War without a scratch, and then he got himself killed by a hit-and-run driver right over there in front of the tavern, and it happened just a month ago. On Armistice Day. Hit-and-run. A man dead. Yeah, about 2 o'clock in the morning, they say to this day, they haven't caught up with a driver. To... Say, what's the matter, son? You're white as a sheep. I felt like I'd been hit hard below the belt. I don't remember what I told the old man. All I could think of was Jonesy on Armistice Day. A hit and run death and a slimy maggot breaking a wishbone charm between fat fingers. But my next step was mechanical. I started checking rooming houses that catered strictly to artists, and the third one paid off. More than I expected. Cordelia. Yes, I remember Cordelia. Come in. Thanks. And she did have a room here, Mrs. Winkle. Yes, she did. Now, what was it about Cordelia, Mr. Marlowe? Well, I am a friend of hers, Mrs. Winkle, a good friend. I'm trying to locate her. I see. Well, Cordelia left quite suddenly in the middle of the night, Mr. Marlowe. Left a half-finished canvas behind, too. Beautiful thing. Yes, sometimes artists have to spread their wings and fly. Even in the middle of the night? Ah, yes. I used to myself when I was younger, heaven knows. Tell me, Mr. Marlowe, is anything wrong about Cordelia? Why do you ask that, Mrs. Winkle? Because the morning after she left, it was the armistice day, I think. A man came here asking about her. A fat man. Did you know him? No. And from what I read in his face, I don't think I'd like to. Look, Mrs. Winkle, i got to find out all I can about the guy right away. He means trouble for Jonesy, uh, Cordelia. You see, she... Oh, what I mean is... Don't uh... bother explaining. I think I understand. As it turned out, this fellow used the telephone while he was here. His name is... Uh, oh, let me see now. Uh, Orland, uh, something weak and sniveling like this. Big, big, bigly. That's it. Orland Bigley. He made a reservation at the Beekman Plaza Hotel in Hollywood. Begley, Beekman Plaza, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, now look, did you tell him anything about Jonesy leaving like she did? Oh, goodness, no. I said she planned on leaving. Uh. I even told him what we had for breakfast. He just smiled. It was dirty. Then he went away. That's all I know. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mrs. Winkle. Thanks a lot. Good luck, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Good luck, she said. <laughs> sure. All the good luck Marlowe and a girl named Jonesy had coming was burned out on a street corner at 2 o'clock in the morning a month ago. But we still had a chance. If I could only talk to Jonesy. All the way back to L.A., I worried because... For that, I had to find her first. I was halfway down the hall to my apartment when I heard it. My phone. 
I ran to the door and practically ripped it off the hinges before it stopped ringing. Hello? Hello, darling. Jonesy. Jonesy, where are you? Oh, that doesn't matter. I just called to say goodbye, Phil. I couldn't leave without that. Now, look, you're not going any place. You're going to sit tight right where you are till I get there. No, it's no use, Phil. I'm in a bad jam. I should have told you all about it long ago, but, well, it's too late now. It's not too late, baby. I just got back from Laguna. Honey, I know all about it. Look, look, you're in love with a good private eye, you remember? Don't run, baby. That's not the answer. There isn't any answer, Phil. There never was for us. Jonesy, please, will you shut up and listen to me for a minute? I can't, Phil. I've thought it all over. My mind's made up. So I'm going to have to get out of this mess in my own way. Honey, we've got to talk. Come on, where are you? Please, Phil. Please, can't you see I'm having an awful tough time with this pitch as it is? Jonesy, baby, look... Don't make it tougher on me. I'm sorry, poor Phil, but thanks for the buggy ride, Mr. Swell, while it lasted. Baby, baby, you can't run. Don't try it. I know that, but I... Okay, Jonesy. We'll make it the hard way. Since I couldn't stop Jonesy from running, I figured I could at least stop the guy who was chasing her. So I called the Beekman Plaza and found out that all in Begley was still registered. I got in my car and started for the hotel, but then I got another idea. There was a good chance that a sleazy, blackmailing crumb like Beggy carried a record of his own. Anyway, it was worth a try and would pay off better now than a beating. So I went to police headquarters instead where Detective Lieutenant Matthews was his old sympathetic self as usual. So, you got some citizen all staked out and now you want to find out if he's a crook, huh, Marla? What is this, something new in crime detection? Now look, Matthews, I'll come down some quiet Tuesday and we'll make all the jokes all afternoon. But right now... Now, wait a minute. If you're going to dip into police files, I would like to know a little bit more about it. Huh? No joke. All right, the guy goes by the name of Olin Begley. Fat, dark, six one, about 40. Mm. Could be anything from a badger to a bum check artist. Right now, he's shooting an angle that includes me. So I find him in the files. I want an exclusive on him for ten minutes. Then he's all yours. Yeah? And what's the hooker? Why are you included? Because of a brunette named Jones. Oh. Jones, sir. Yes, Jones. Like to make it Marlowe someday. Oh, fool, Matthews. This time I'm serious. Okay, Phil. Okay, help yourself. You'll find about 3,000 fat guys in there, you know. 2,000 of them with dark hair. Go ahead and start. I'll send in one of the clerks to give you a hand. Matthews' guess was close. But with the clerk's help and hard work, we narrowed the field down to a few hundred cars and started through. The street lights had been on outside for an hour before we finally found it. Forty pounds lighter and sporting a mustache, but there was no doubt about it. James Orland, alias Jim Orlo, alias Orlan Biglow, was now Orlan Begley with charges that ran from petty thievery in Louisiana to one that even got Matthews on the ball. Begley was wanted for murder in Rhode Island. What are we waiting for, Marlo? Let's go get him. Piled into the squad car and headed up Sunset Boulevard, I began to feel good again. For the first time since Jonesy had run away at the square dance. When we turned up Whitley, Matthews cut the siren and two blocks above the boulevard, we stopped. Around the corner from the Beekman Plaza. It was a two-story frame hotel held together by countless coats of cheap paint only. And inside a line of empty sweet air bottles said it took something more than ordinary ventilation to keep the musty smell from getting thick enough to chew. Jittery night clerk managed to tell us that Begley had room 212 and left his mouth hanging open while Matthew sent him outside. Marlowe, you mentioned 10 minutes alone with him. You still want it? Yeah. It's important to me, Matthew. Hmm. Okay. Somebody's got to go up and get him. Might as well be you. Look, the boys will cover his window from outside and both ends of the hall from the landings. If it gets tight, just whistle and duck. Go ahead. <laughs> Upstairs to the second floor where the only light was a red bulb at the far end of the hall marked fire exit. Just then, midway down, I saw a figure backing out of a door. A fat figure was having trouble with a lock. He turned, took three fast steps toward me before he realized I was there. It was all in Begley. When he saw me, he stopped and began slowly backing up. Hey, you, uh, what do you want? What, what are you doing here? Where is she, Begley? I, I don't know. She ran out, I guess. It's all off, anyway. I'm not going through with it. I, I changed my mind. Sure you did. Come here, you! You lousy, murdering pig, Begley. Get up! 
How did you know that? How'd you find out? Police files bulletin from Rhode Island. Uh, you mean you... Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm hot. I had to have dough. That's the only reason I tried to shake the kid down. I, yeah, but listen, uh, you got me now, so let's make a deal. I'll keep my yap shut. Not one word about that hit and run. You let me out of here. Bad chance. You slimy me. Oh, okay, sucker. I've killed him more than once. But you won't stop me. Nice going, Marlo. You got him. Flat on his face where he belongs. Hey, where are you going? Find Jonesy, Matthews. I got to talk to her. Hey, Lieutenant. Yeah? There's a brunette here in this guy's room. You better come in. Well, you hear that, Marlo? Brunette. Well, let's go. It looks like you can do your talking right here and now. Come on, boy. with Matthews, all right. But it didn't work out like he expected because what I had to say to Jonesy then just couldn't be said. Not in a cheap hotel with a bunch of tough cops standing around it. I had to wait. Wait for the hours of a long night to pass. The night I spent pounding the sidewalks through miles of back streets while I tried to get hold of myself. But all that had been 12 hours ago. Now it was morning. Now I could look at her again. Yeah, now as I followed Mr. Early down the gray carpeted hall to a door, I figured I could tell Jonesy all I wanted to say. She's here, Mr. Marlowe. In here. Thanks. Well, Jonesy, I guess you didn't understand that the two people are in love. They share everything. You didn't give me a chance, Jonesy. You see, I found out Begley was a killer after you'd already gone to his hotel to get him. You crazy kid. You should have trusted me, Jonesy. Played it straight. Because no matter how you added up, we had something worth waiting for. Well... As you said. Thanks for the buggy ride, baby. It was great. Oh. Here's your little charm. Wishbone. Sorry it's broken. Goodbye, Jonesy. I can do to help Mr. Mullo? No, no. Nothing. Thanks. Mm. Good day, sir. Hillcrest Mortuary. Mr. Early is speaking. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Gene Bates, Bill Johnstone, Jane Morgan, John Daner, Edgar Barrier, and Ann Morrison. The square dance was called by Paul Pierce. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard O'Rourke. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a tobacco-chewing engineer, a redhead running a bulldozer and a leprechaun on a drag line, all added up to death at an unfinished trestle. And there could have been more. But then I found out which one had actually submitted the lowest bid. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Gerald Moore, comes to you every Saturday evening at this same time, transcribed.